This first slide is about the big one, which is going to be happening in Parliament Square from the 21st to the 24th of April. And you may remember back in late December uh, 2022, uh, Extinction Rebellion said that they were stopping uh, action that would disrupt the general public. And instead, they were inviting everyone to come to Parliament Square in April. Well, we're in April. Preparations are underway. And I think the most remarkable thing is that we have some 70 organizations, including Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, PCS Union. And in fact, if you go to the um, Extinction Rebellion website, you'll be able to see uh, all of them. They include Ecotricity. Um, I'd be surprised if Waitrose wasn't there. And if not, it's only a matter of time. So basically, it's an opportunity for everyone to come uh, for a family-friendly event over four days uh, in Parliament Square, and I hope you'll join us. So, do come. Oh, you'll need to click the first one. So, my talk today is all about scientists speaking out, and it's a real pleasure to first thank lots of the people who helped create these slides, in particular researching them. And you can see us here in Trafalgar Square. We are sitting on the road wearing our trademark uh, white lab coats. Uh, we're not glued to the street. Um, we're basically enjoying the sunshine. Now, my own field is research on pheromones. So these are the invisible chemical signals that animals use to communicate. You could say that I study armpits across the animal kingdom, and sometimes worse. Um, it smells of every kind, whether it's badger bottoms or anything else. The last chapter in the book is all about humans. And I talk about Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a real enthusiast. And you may know the letter in which he writes to Josephine saying, don't wash, I'm coming at home. Uh, I actually like my husband freshly washed, um, so I don't take my work home. But it's the thing professionally that's given me the most pleasure of everything. And so you can imagine, back in uh, 2018, I was really looking forward to writing the third edition. The second edition had already won an award. But as I started to put things together, I realized to my horror that most of the animals were in danger and that many of them would go extinct in the lifetime of my student readers. So basically, it was all about habitat loss. Uh, we're talking about land habitats disappearing. But also, the seas were warming and becoming uh, more acidified. The coral reefs are disappearing, as you know, and that wipes out a lot of chapter four. Frogs are very dependent on temperature. Um, that's a large part of chapter five. So basically, by 2040, the book is going to be half the size. All we're going to be left with is cockroaches and bed bugs. Now, they have fabulous pheromones. But it's a problem, because so many of the animals are going to be disappearing. And what it made me realize is that rather than editing the book and taking the animals out and basically writing the obituaries, which is what uh, 21st century ecologists find ourselves doing, wouldn't it be better to try to stop the emergency? So before I knew it, I was standing outside um, Murdoch Towers uh, opposite the Shard. Um, this is the home of News UK. It's where the Sun newspaper, a tabloid newspaper, is based. You can think of it as the center of evil. Um, it's the evil empire of climate denial. And if you're Star Wars fans, um, it's the Death Star. So imagine Darth Vader doing his heavy breathing deep inside the building. And I'm standing outside um, wearing my lab coat. Uh, in case I forget, it's got a label saying I'm a scientist. 
And I'm holding up a placard that quotes David Attenborough saying, civilization is on course for collapse. And it's pointing out that the newspapers basically say nothing. And a particular case in point was, you remember a week ago, the IPCC had its groundbreaking synthesis report saying that in most uncertain, most certain terms, that uh, things are getting bad and fast. What the tabloid newspapers and the right-wing press do is basically deny that these things are happening. In this case, on the day when the IPCC was saying things were as dire as ever, if not worse, the Daily Mail had at least the right headline. Climate catastrophe is imminent, says UN. And then they ruined it by putting it on page 19, a two-inch splash underneath 12 inches of story about two pensioners fighting about a car parking space in Dorset. So it was just kind of absurd. And when they're not bigging up the morals of Love Island and the latest soap star scandal, they are denigrating and trying to delegitimize climate activists. And if we're not eco-yobs, we're eco-terrorists, they will come up with anything to basically say that we're not important. Now, I'm standing outside Murdoch Towers and feeling quite vulnerable, because I know high up, like Sauron in his tower, is a tabloid editor who is looking down. And in my white lab coat, I'm basically a walking caricature of an activist scientist. I'm almost a tabloid editor's wet dream. And that's not a nice thought. So as I'm there, I'm thinking that the editor is looking down and basically mocking me. So for a start, I'm white, I'm middle class, and my name is Tristram. The editor would then go on to mock my life of hardship, going from being a student at Cambridge to 20 years as a professor at Cambridge. Oh, actually, Oxford. It, they're so easily confused. And they would go on to realize that if we're talking about my natural habitat, as a Tristram, it could only be Waitrose. And that's a store, if you're not in the UK, that is so posh, it's where King Charles uh, sells his biscuits. And I'm not as posh as Charles, but I am, like most scientists, part of the 1%. And that puts me in a position of privilege. And I'll never forget the moment in London where I was with my partner in a London Waitrose and he shouted out across a crowded store, Tristram, do we have toasted sesame oil in Oxford? And not one, but three Tristrams turned around. So really, we are in a position of privilege. But there's no point in having privilege unless you use it to some good advantage. And that's why I, like many other scientists, are getting involved in protest. So the plan is to remind you about the emergencies, what governments do, why peaceful protest is important, and why scientists should protest too. And by the end of it, I want to persuade you that there are many things that you can do, that you should speak out about what is happening. Do not be silent about the climate and ecological emergency. And I hope that you might join us. And if you can't do that, that you'll speak up in support and help donate. The reason for mentioning this is that it's comparatively easy to predict the temperature rise that will come from a given set of carbon emissions. And this may surprise you. So these are the predictions made in 1982. You can see in black the predicted, and in blue and red the carbon dioxide concentration and temperature change. And what you can see 
is that the predictions were really accurate. But what may surprise you is that this was an oil company. Their own scientists were predicting more accurately how fast the planet would boil, but in public they denied this was happening, all the more to make profits for another 30 years. And Kevin Anderson is excoriating. He's reminding us that at current rates, we're burning through our budget really fast. Every month, we burn through about 1% of our budget, a budget that only gives us a chance of keeping below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the resulting temperature rise is simply physics. You can't magic that away. And the carbon cut, as he points out, needs to start now. We need a 10% cut in emissions every year from today. And in the UK, it's particularly important, as here, as in other developed countries, we need to go faster to give some headroom for the global south. And we can't wait until 2040 to start. And the idea of trapping carbon is simply nonsensical. We can't do business as usual until 2050 in the hope that we can trap it. So basically, already at 1.2, as you'll know, it's worse than we expected. And it's also very unpredictable. So we've got floods, we've got droughts, we've got forest fires in California, Greece, and Australia. We had 40 degrees in London last year, and that gave the London Fire Brigade the busiest day since the Blitz. And of course, food insecurity is increasing. Soon, it won't be just tomatoes that we can't get in the supermarkets. And everything is worse in the global south, whether that's the flooding or the famine in East Africa. Somebody I really admire is Guterres, UN Secretary General. And what I really like is he's incredibly blunt. And basically, he's saying that we're putting our world at immediate risk of hurtling past the 1.5 degree temperature increase limit. But in the meantime, he also mentions the threats to biodiversity, the sledgehammer to our world's rich biodiversity. And he knows who the culprits are. It's the bottomless greed of the fossil fuel industry and its enablers. Now, in 2021, the International Energy Agency said, if governments are serious, there can be no new investment in oil, gas, and coal from now. And that was two years ago. But what did governments do? Well, I'm afraid you know the answer. And it's hard to keep this slide up to date. In the last two weeks, we've had the Willow developments in Alaska that Biden has given the go-ahead. And one of the crucial things, it's the banking giants that are pouring money year after year without limit. And a lot of that is going through London. And the problem is that scientists' warnings simply don't work. We've been giving warnings for more than 40 years. And we write a lot of policy but it's simply not enough. And the demonstration that it's not enough is this. And you may have seen this graph before. In black, we've got the rising carbon dioxide levels in parts per million. At the bottom, we've got the years from 1960 to 2020. And superimposed, we've got Ed Hawkins' climate strikes. strikes. And superimposed on that, we have all the reports. And what you can see is the carbon dioxide emissions continue to rise without pause. And 60% of emissions have been happening since 1990, the first IPCC report. And this year is projected to be the highest ever. And it's the same with biodiversity. You can plot all the biodiversity COPs, 15 of them, and basically, we continue to fail to reach any of our targets, and the biodiversity crisis continues, and basically biodiversity diminishes year by year. 
So what's going on? So the reason there's no change is corruption. If we were in any other country, that's what we'd call it. And the problem is that scientists go to government with data and information. But the corporations and lobbyists go with money. So who do the government listen to? Well, I think the shocking thing, actually, it isn't very much money. So far as the Conservative Party is concerned with its MPs, it's only 1.7, perhaps at most 3.5 million pounds of donations. Because what really matters is what the tabloid press, in particular the Daily Mail and the Murdoch press, are saying. And that's who they are scared of. And the result is we subsidize the destruction of our planet. So basically, they have the government so much under control that we give the fossil fuel industry money. The second reason is another kind of corruption, which is the scientists go to the people with information, but corporations deliberately offer misinformation. And that misinformation is pushed by the fossil fuel industry, who have learned from the tobacco industry that the best thing to do is first deny, spread doubt, and then delay any response by government. And there's a wonderful series on BBC iPlayer that's worth watching. And what it means is the public is uninformed, if they're not misinformed, because the media simply don't cover it. And one of the extraordinary things about 2022 is if you look at every word that was spoken on television, cake was mentioned 10 times more than climate change. It was a good year for Bake Off. So what we have is an uninformed and misinformed public, and thus no pressure on the government. And Greta Thunberg puts it well, as always. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if your house is on fire, because it is. So scientists have tried everything. And who better to ask than IPCC authors? 81% agree that they should be advocates uh, on climate change. And two thirds are already doing it. And they really have tried everything. So they've lobbied governments. They've signed endless petitions. They've even gone on protests. A quarter of the scientists for the IPCC have gone on protests. And I want to mention just one example of a success of scientists stepping up and actually changing the basically what happened in the world. And this was the ozone layer, which led to the Montreal Protocol. So basically, um, Sherry was able to demonstrate that the CFCs were destroying the ozone layer. And he then very actively, he was not a silent um, participant, very actively he campaigned to get governments to actually put legislation into action to make change. And what he wrote on his Nobel Prize speech was, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if, in the end, all we're willing to do is to stand around and wait for the inevitable to come true. And without his advocacy, uh, nothing would have changed. And you know the result is actually one of the success stories of scientific advocacy and good science. And actually, we were able to roll that back. And the hole is now getting smaller. So why did scientists learn led campaigns sometimes succeed. Another is the nuclear test ban treaty. And basically, Sherry's problem was that he was fighting um, a very rich and powerful industry that had many congressmen um, paid up. The problem for climate change is the fossil fuels are the most profitable industries in human history. And basically, they have used their money to control government. And basically, every politician on both sides of any divide, whether that's the Republicans and Democrats or every part of our own parliament, is bought up. And this is sufficient to delay action. 
So if scientists have tried everything else, what's left? And the answer, many people argue, myself included, is peaceful civil disobedience. So why? Well, basically, it's the thing that has brought us all sorts of progress through the 20th century, whether it's the suffragettes, who actually weren't always peaceful, to Gandhi and his campaigns in India for independence, at Rosa Parks and the bus boycott in the USA, Martin Luther King uh, supporting that bus boycott. But there's a space there. And the space is for Bayard Rustin, and he's the link between Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Bayard Rustin was a black gay man who went to India many times and was inspired by non-violent civil disobedience. And he persuaded Martin Luther King to use that as his tactic to make change. Bayard Rustin is also a wonderful example of intersectionality because later in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, he was very active in the gay rights movement and was successful in getting those changes through too. But what we have to remember uh, when the Daily Mail is ranting about eco yogs is that at the time, civil disobedience is never popular. It's only afterwards when history is being rewritten that suddenly Martin Luther King is everybody's hero. Another example is ACT UP, started in New York when Reagan wouldn't even mention the word HIV and AIDS. And they were successful in disrupting all sorts of things, including uh, masses in the Catholic cathedral and things happening at the CDC, and were successful in getting all sorts of changes. And the important take home from Frederick Douglass, a slave himself and later a campaigner against slavery in 19th century America, is that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And Guterres, again, is very direct. He says climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, or particularly in things like the Daily Mail. But the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. So it's the fossil fuel companies and their enablers. So back in 2019, 2020, climate protest has had significant effects. So here are Extinction Rebellion uh, activists outside the Bank of England. And basically, if you look at what people are concerned about in public opinion, well, when they're actually being flooded out, they are extremely worried back in 2014 or so. But actually, the London Extinction Rebellion protests when Oxford Street and the bridges were blocked actually did lead to an enormous amount of interest. And we were successful in getting um, Theresa May to declare a climate emergency. And for a brief nanosecond, the Daily Express um, did go green and supported a green revolution. Uh, they went back to old ideas later. So civil disobedience does seem to work. What about scientists? Scientists should be protesting simply as citizens. But I think there is actually more than that. And that's because we're special in some particular ways. And Einstein said, those who have the privilege have a duty to act. And it's partly this messenger effect. Scientists and academics are generally trusted and respected. You'll know that after doctors and other medics and paramedics, we're greatly trusted. And at the other end of the scale, it's uh, politicians, estate agents, and journalists. And if we take action, it shows how serious the situation is. We are well informed. We know what we're doing. And if we take action, it emphasizes how serious the situation is. And how seriously we take it uh, lends weight. And it also lends legitimacy to the whole climate movement. And it challenges the stereotypes in the newspapers. And there is a noble history of scientists standing up. Um, this is Carl Sagan, arguably the most famous scientist of his time. 
and more recently, a NASA scientist and one of the founders of modern climate science is being arrested at a protest about tar sands outside the White House. Now, here's a, a protest near a home. This is outside the department formerly known as the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. And we're particularly proud of the way that the placards beautifully match the color uh, of the um, department. Um, we're protesting about the department licensing new exploration against its own advice in the, new, the North Sea, when the slogan is new oil and gas equals death. Now, the important thing about this action is that it's science-based. Basically, we're pointing out to the department um, the science that says they should and must keep the fossil fuels in the ground. It's proportionate. We're trying to prevent a greater harm. It's symbolic. And it's a last resort. All of us have written our letters and signed those petitions. And even though we are breaking the law, it's legitimate and indeed nine scientists were arrested. And what you can see behind the scientists is scientific papers blown up large enough for a minister to read. All, I'm happy to say, have now been acquitted. So many academics can perceive barriers to joining activism. And some of these include the fear of dismissal or your contract, if you're on short-term contracts, not being renewed. There's also the pressure of time. There's the worry about being the first in your research group to take an action and stepping outside your area of expertise. As soon as I go outside pheromones, I start to get nervous. And we're worried about losing our credibility. What will people think of us if we protest? And in fact, some research suggests that actually our credibility increases if we take action because it shows that we're concerned. And in fact, it can increase our credibility. And some of the things that universities ought to be doing to support us is basically removing some of those barriers, including some of those insecurities. And if some of us are activists, they ought to be defending that activism and defending it proudly. So to give one example, Emma Smart, a fish biologist, a taxonomist, is being arrested here outside the Bay's action. But what Extinction Rebellion has realized is the costs of being arrested and putting oneself at risk can be very different. If you're a person of color, if you have caring responsibilities, things are not the same. And so one of the things that we've been emphasizing in recent years is the many ways that you can contribute. And there are so many ways. You don't have to be gluing yourself to something sitting down in the road. There are lots of other things that you can be doing. And we really invite you to get involved, whether it's handing out leaflets or even just speaking out um, when you're having tea with somebody. So one of the things that I think is really missing is our most prominent scientists. Where is our Carl Sagan? I'm delighted that David Attenborough is now starting to speak out. It's really important. We need those role models. And when somebody says that they're speaking out behind the scenes, that they're having an influence on government, just remind them of the graph, that basically doing it through official channels appears to have had no impact whatsoever. Now, if you're prominent in public life, there were lots of worries. It might affect the chance of becoming knighted or becoming damned. But we have to remember that there are no honors, or for that matter, grants, on a dead planet. And what we need is for people to be much bolder and more like the UN General Secretary. And scientists are increasingly writing that basically things as usual are not working. So here are the top authors saying, we can no longer carry on as normal. Acceptable conventional forms of influence are not working. The scientists who alerted the world to the climate and ecological crises 
have a moral duty to join the popular movement. And I think that's what we're doing in Scientists for Extinction Rebellion and Scientists' Rebellion. So I hope you'll feel that scientists are justified in peaceful protest. I hope you might join them, whether or not you're a scientist, that you'll speak up more about climate change. One of my weirdest moments was being prompted by the soup thrown on over the Van Gogh um, painting in the National Gallery. I was out for dinner with a banker friend, and that was the prompt to talk about climate change. It wouldn't have come up otherwise. And his bank is one of the worst offenders. What I'll also hope is whether or not you're able to come on the protests, that you'll be able to support it with donations and also speaking out to, when, to anybody else you're talking to. And what I will hope is that you'll join us with your family and friends in April at the big one in Parliament Square. So I think in a few moments we're going to go informal and have a panel discussion. The email is up there um, if you're watching online and want to send in a question. And um, thank you very much. So um, I've introduced myself. Um, perhaps uh, our other three panellists could start by introducing themselves. Um, my name is Pete. I'm a PhD student here, and I work on air quality. Um, I became interested in uh, scientists, activist groups, having lived in Beijing for some years, where I saw the air pollution so thick that sometimes you couldn't see the next building. I knew something was wrong. When I got back to the UK, I realised that all was not right here either in terms of its air quality, and that all the science was there, but the policies were not, and I saw that as the barrier. Um, I got involved in doing the PhD to see if I could make a difference, but then having gone through the PhD process, I've realised how little impact I've been able to have doing the business as usual. So this is why um, joining a scientist activist group for me was the most impactful. Hi, uh, everyone. Yeah, I'm Shanna. Um, I guess, yeah, so uh, I'm a technician at UCL at the moment. Uh, my background is in applied physics and space engineering, um, and also a PhD candidate for um, astronomical instrumentation at UCL. Um, I think I've been concerned about the climate for literally as long as I can remember, uh, like since I was a child. Um, I remember it was like the biggest anxiety in my life. Uh, I think my parents remember I used to run around the, you know, the house turning off all the lights because I was scared of like using too much energy. Um, I was scared about sea level rise. Thanks. Uh, I think we saw the movie 2012 when I was a kid. Bad move. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and but strangely, I guess I was very anxious about it as a child, um, but I didn't see a way to change things. I kind of just hoped that adults would sort it out, that something would happen drastically. Um, and then kind of in my teens and kind of early 20s, I did forget about it a bit, a bit because I got wrapped up in my own life. Um, I, went to, I did my um, undergrad and my postgrad, uh, went to the Netherlands, but when I came back, I saw the things that Extinction Rebellion were doing and it kind of, I guess, awoken something in me about you know, that, those old anxieties and just seeing people do something really inspired me. Um, so I just kind of showed up alone to protests. Um, at one point I saw two people in a lab coat and I was like, hi, you know, what's, what's this about? And they explained scientists of XR to me. And I said, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I explained my background. And they were like, yeah, join up. Um, and I think just... Yeah, for, for me also, like, it, I think it's the right thing to do, obviously, but also just uh, for my own mental and emotional health, I think it really, like, helped. <laughs> just, like, you know, um, just feeling like I'm trying something and I'm trying to people who are also willing to try something. So, you know, even if we fail, and I don't think it is about failing, I think this isn't a win or lose scenario, I think it's about losing less. You know, every degree that we can claw back is a win. Um, you know, even if things get bad, I'm just happy to be working with people who care and are willing to fight for it. So, yeah. Chris, online, do you want to introduce yourself? So, hi, I'm Chris. I am a chemist. Um, I did my undergrad chemistry degree at Bristol, um, and I then studied to be a teacher. Um, I spent 16 years teaching some of the most amazing, beautiful, just the minds on these these human beings, and 
and I, and I thought, okay, we're teach, we're talking about climate change. We're having these amazing discussions. We're going away, and we're talk, we're we're going to these mini UN days and and, and doing all of these amazing things. And, and <clears throat> my hope was that I would inspire the next generation um, to, to to take action. Um, and some of what what really really triggered things for me was when I when I met some of my old students, some of, some of the people that I consider the best and the brightest, and, and they'd sort of, not that there's anything particularly wrong with this, but they just got into finance and served themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, we had long sort of discussions about that, that whole process. I mean, I, I've got to do something a little bit more proactive. Um, so in essence, you know, I stopped teaching, um, I started um, my company, Hexus Plus, um, and we, we we started doing this sort of two-pronged approach. Um, in 2019, um, I discovered Extinction Rebellion as, as, as a sort of a foghorn, a huge, loud foghorn for, for this, this thing that's been sitting there for my entire life, you know, as, a, as a, someone that's been on the Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth mailing list since I was probably 10 years old. Um, you know, hearing about this issue and, and being sort of incentivized to to try and take action on it um, was was being heard much louder and much clearer. Um, and so I, I felt that my my company who support the you know creation of of green entities, um, you know, organisations that try and deal with waste and and, and and education around climate change and things like that. Um, it was the natural place for me to go, and I've spent many, many years um, working with the the amazing human beings that are that are there, that that are all aligned with 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 this. We must do something. We must do something, and there is a plan, and there and, and there is a really coherent plan and strategy. And so I've st- I stuck around, and I stuck around, and and, and I'm still here. Um, and so I, I guess that that in essence sums up a lot of what I'm doing. Um, and now I'm I'm sort of looking at how we do things and you know where where we can go from here. That's 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 it. If you there, you know my my call out really you know is is to the teachers that are out there. There are some amazing teachers that have joined XR, um, and there will be tutors and teachers listening. Um, you know, and we, we need to use use our intelligence and our sense of agency um, to get up there. There's a huge number of you scientists that I've worked with over, you know, 11 different schools in, in London and, and a couple of schools in Bristol. You know, we need to be getting ourselves out there and, and making change happen, you know, with more agency than than, than we do. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. We, we've got uh, one question come in online. Um, feel free to ask questions in the room too. But this question online is a really important one. I think it's uh, from Almos uh, Rakita, who asks, can you get arrested and charged as a terrorist for joining the big one? Now, this is a a question I think that a lot of people are worried about, especially when visa issues and and security around um, their own situations come into play. Not everyone can get arrested. Is that likely to happen if people were to come to the big one? Uh, no. Um, now, with the British police, nothing can be guaranteed. But uh, the intention of the family-friendly events in Parliament Square is that it's not confrontational, uh, no ar- arrests are anticipated, and there's a... Um, a video that's online uh, on the Extinction Rebellion's website, I think, uh, that they've been tweeting, which is um, tips, which basically say, um, if a police person asks you to move, just move. Uh, If you're standing on the pavement and waving a flag, uh, there should be no reason for arrest. So we're not anticipating arrests. The idea is to get as many different kinds of organizations who normally don't get involved in protest at all um, to basically fill the streets. And in a way, I wasn't joking when I was saying Waitrose. It's every kind of organization. We don't have the National Trust yet, uh, 
but all sorts of other organisations like the Wildlife Trust um, are getting on board. And so the idea is to broaden the appeal. So the answer is um, the risk is very low and there are ways um, on the day of ensuring that it is highly unlikely to happen. Chris, you've got a point. Yeah, so, so the other thing to add is that, that we've been in communication with the police as well in a, in a sort of in a two-way relationship to make sure that this, this is as inclusive as is, is possible um, so that people that, that cannot get arrested or, or, you know, like teachers, for example, um, or, or, or any other places. We've got doctors and, and, and nurses and, and all sorts of other people as well, which we should have huge impacts. Um, coming along and joining, but yeah, we've been in communication with the police. They are very aware that we're, we're coming, and you know they are facilitating that, um, as is we would expect in a doc democracy like ours. So yes, I think I think we're we're, we're safe as long as you're not doing something um, that you know personally you take your own responsibility to do whatever you want to do. We that, this is a family friendly event. Um, no one should be getting arrested. Yeah, we have uh, two questions. Um, we'll, we'll go to uh, uh, you at the back, please, first. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll pass you the microphone so people online can hear. Hi. So I was wondering, as a scientist, um, if you want to take part in the big one, we, how do you come along as a scientist rather than just a normal protester? Thank you. Um, I cannot answer that. I think there's a. Uh, we we tend to walk around with lab coats on. What do you do if you don't have a lab coat? Well, there's um, uh, there are there will be the, the, uh, a science hub in Hyde Park. I understand that there. Oh. Old Palace. Old Palace Yard. Old Palace Yard. Sorry, Old Palace Yard, and that will be a place where I anticipate there will be something you can wear to show that you are a scientist. Now, I don't know if that is necessarily going to be a lab coat. It may well be a big sticker saying I'm a scientist, but something like that will be available. And that's, that has been very important to have on these protests because when you have a lot of people around and you're there, and because you want to show people that you're a scientist, how do you do that if you don't have a sign? So I think it's a really important thing to have. Yeah, and if you're an academic as well, um, we have something called the Education Hub that's happening there as well. Um, I have flyers here. Um, basically, we're going to put on talks and training centered around um, getting to climate activism and the climate movement in academic settings, so in universities and schools and things as well. So if you're a researcher or someone who works in an academic institution, we're going to have a series of talks and things to help basically, um, yeah, how can we mobilize basically as a climate movement in academic spheres. And um, the other thing is to um, join uh, Scientists for Extinction Rebellion, search out the website um, and uh, get on the, the WhatsApp group because uh, that's where lots of the organising happens um, and you can contribute also. We'd be delighted. Chris, anything to add? Um, I think if anyone's got any particularly um, interesting topic, uh, you know, then you know, talk, talk to uh, Shana or... or Pete or you know anyone anyone involved here um, because you know we might it would be really really good to have some some excellent talks and there's a lot of time to fill um, you know there's going to be a lot of opportunity to, to talk to people um, and also we, we're doing our, our own research project as well so if you if you have any experience of doing uh, sort of qualitative or quantitative research then then there are other opportunities too um, we're, you know, we're still looking for people to help out with that. Um, just to mention that Scientists for Extinction Rebellion is UK focused. Uh, there is also the sister uh, group, and many of us are, are members of both, Scientists Rebellion, uh, which has uh, groups in many other countries around the world, uh, including Scandinavia, um, Netherlands, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, USA, uh, USA um, Australia. Australia. So if you're in any of those other countries, um, go to Scientist Rebellion. Also, uh, Panama, I understand, has got quite a strong um, 
group. So six, six or seven countries yeah, in, Africa. in Africa were also a part of Scientist Rebellion. So yeah, that's a truly international group. Question at the front. Um, this question Sorry. Maybe, maybe intentionally provocative because Tristram did actually. Thank you, Dr. Wyatt, for actually, Professor Wyatt for mentioning this in your speech. But um, I've had the because uh, I've tried to be sort of engaged a bit myself, but I've come across. A, a sort of sticking point with professionals, and I'm thinking of a conference I was at in January, and two quite senior um, professional researchers, both in the, in the field of algal research, but one of them in particular said, but I engage very clearly and firmly with the climate crisis in my professional work. I don't have time, and I can't spare the credibility to lend it to protest. So you might have an answer to that. And the other one was just so busy with her professional and personal and off-piste activities, she didn't really see the point. Do you have a comeback to that in terms of what protests can do that your ordinary, everyday professional life can't achieve? Just to, speaking to other scientists. Thank you. Uh, Chris, would you mind muting? Because I think there's a bit of feedback going on. Thank you. I think the repost is understandable and I think you might, might have touched a guilty nerve <laughs> um, so people are going to be defensive and um, I think that the challenge to put back is how far has it got us so far and that was something that came up with researchers studying biodiversity recording a decline year by year by year in other words monitoring decline hadn't stopped it and there must come a point where, like um, Jim Hansen, who was the most notable climate scientist in the US at the time, stepping forward and joining the protests. He'd done everything he could do, appearing before Congress, writing his papers, writing his reports. There came a point at which he wanted to use his credibility to actually push for change. And I think we are coming to that stage. I mean, something that has only really hit me in the last six months or so is the feeling of urgency. So I've taken a very long view, and yes, we're gradually getting there. And certainly if you listen to the government, you know, we've halved emissions and all these other claims. But actually, the scale of change that's needed is quite different from business as usual. And I think one of the things that scientists are starting to say is that business as usual as scientists must come to an end. That not only governments, not only countries, but actually scientists have to change what we're doing. And it's very uncomfortable because what we've spent our lives training ourselves to do is jump through the hoops, finally getting down to writing the grants and the papers, having a modicum of success, why would we do something else and why would we put it in jeopardy? But when people say there are no grants or honours on a dead planet, actually that really is serious. If in 10 years time we're powering through those limits and we're going past the tipping points, then we're not going to be worrying about grants. And I think it takes a lot for scientists to actually realise that this is affecting their own lives in a very personal way. Chris, did you have any anything online to add? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, a, an individual can can have you know quite a level of influence. Um, so, a lot of the work that I I've been doing for the last sort of year and a half is looking at like the impact of process and the sort of ripples that come out from the so from what is happening. Um, you know, so you might have a single influencer that, that might be able to say X, Y, Z. If you've got 4,000 or 5,000 people all recording, all sending sending these things out, you, you have people like Matt Hancock. Now, whether you like him or not, um, he does care about social media, and he, and, and there is a there is definitely an increase in the uh, uh, perception 
um, and, and, the, and the care about what people are saying on social media. So, so when you have all of those people all coming together, and or a hundred thousand as we're, as we're aiming for for the big one, um, you've got so many influencers, so many people lending their their voices, which which then can be you know amplify amplify the message um, beyond which you know any any individual. Um, scientists have talked about. You know, we've had prominent scientists like Einstein, uh, and you know, we've known about this problem for over 100, about 150 years. In reality, um, the, the postulation has, has, has been there, and prominent scientists have talked about it all the way along, individually. When we come together, that's that's really where the, the power of collective voices can be seen and, and can be can be measured, and, and that's what I've been doing. Thank you, and Shana. I think, yeah, everything was, yeah, well said. <laughs> right. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I can uh, add an, a, another element here, and that is that I interviewed a seven-year-old a couple of days ago about how he felt about climate change. And he said, I know you're a scientist, and I know you used to be a teacher. And he, he said, I wonder if, he was talking about a place called Kidzania, and that's in London. It's a place where you go as a child and you can learn about lots of different jobs. And we went on a protest there recently because Shell has a, uh, a stand there. And it's about becoming how, how to work essentially in the, with Shell as part of this kind of thing. It was horrendous. But he said, you could be the president of Kidzania and you could uh, t t teach all the children about climate change, and you can tell us the truth. Now, that's something that really does, I think, e expand into the larger world, in a sense that young people want scientists to stand up and talk about the truth, because they know that the truth is not really that clear and people I think people in the general public see scientists as, as truth tellers so I think that they know that the media are not the truth tellers they know that the politicians are not the truth tellers but they do think that scientists and doctors and nurses and people in, in these professions are so I feel a sense of moral duty to, to do what this seven year old was asking and that was that with this position of trust that I think that it does extend beyond publication that goes into journals that my fellow researchers see. It needs to go into the public sphere. Now, I know that a, a, a number of the public may see a scientist being an activist and think, you've lost your credibility because you're political now. Scientists should be impartial. They shouldn't be bringing politics on the streets. And Tristram touched on that a little bit, but I wonder if uh, either of you might be able to, oh, or, uh, and Chris online, respond to people who would point to the scientist on the street and say, you've lost your credibility because you're in a protest. See, I have, like, I have two minds of this, because on one side you want to say, well, it isn't political, because it's just the truth, it's just impartial. But at the same time, everything is political. <laughs> um, and when you come into climate as well, you have to talk about capitalism and the fact that maybe it's the way the system is set up that has led us to this point. Um, and it does get political. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't think that's a reason to not, for scientists to not engage, because... Yeah, well, the stakes are too high for one. Um, at one side, we are, we are, we are as well are citizens. We are humans, um, you know. So we we should be allowed to kind of speak on what we believe is true. Um, yeah, and and to a degree, if you want to be impartial, you don't have to say anything overtly political. You can just say the truth. You can stand there with the papers and say this is what the literature says, and this is what the government is doing. I don't see how that, yeah, that could be seen as <laughs> political, basically, or seen as you coming off as biased because you're just 
quoting the literature and pointing at the situation. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything to add there? So, the as someone that monitors and, and, and works with with green companies, um, there is a there is a, a significant like spike going up. Now, if, you th if scientists think about funding, or where do I, where am I going to get my funding if I lose credibility? There are lots and lots of organisations that are doing very well financially, um, like lots of them. And so, if we are concerned about, you know, oh well, is this fossil fuel company going to care about me protesting? What about all of those wonderful organisations trying to make change happen, who are also philanthropic? And wanting to, to support universities and, and, and things like that, uh, something that you know we've been doing with, with there are there are lots and lots and lots of others. But what I would say is that as as time goes on, and this problem sort of drags its heels, there is going to be more and more people that are going to be wanting to support scientists uh, and research programs and, and all sorts of other things. So maybe we need to rethink things a little bit and not worry so much about, okay, am I going to lose credibility? I'm going to gain credibility by telling the truth. You know, as a scientist, I'm going to gain credibility by, and, and also funding from all of these other entities that are, are, are starting to pop up and starting to do very well. So maybe think about those sort of things when you're, when you're worrying about, am I, am I going to lose credibility? Because, you know, we're in this together and you know. Yeah, th thanks, Chris. I, I, I had a, a, another point to add there, and that is to say that as a scientist who's doing a PhD, I feel that if I lost my credibility now, where do I go? You know, uh, but everyone thinks that at any stage of their scientific career, what happens if you lose your credibility? But in my case, my experience, I've gained credibility exactly as has been said before. Um, the 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 supervi my supervisor, um, professors of the environmental research group, uh, they've all come and congratulated me on my efforts and my activism. They haven't yet stood in the road with me, but they are getting closer and closer every time they see me do something. So I, I really do think the tides are turning, and that by by being a scientist and doing it. You're giving these people who don't do it another reason to get out there and, and, and stand in the streets with us. We have a couple of questions in the, from the audience, and perhaps after these two questions, we can, we can bring it to a close. So, a couple of things. Um, first of all, as a scientist, we always need data. So, have we have, has anyone done any research on whether there are um, people who have protested have um, had discrimination against them and their careers have suffered for, 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 for it. And the other thing is perhaps we can learn something from politics departments because they must always get political and they must know a way through it. And just a third little point is that lawyers are now starting to say they shouldn't be acting for um, companies that are um, burning fossil fuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think we can learn from other fields. We're not on our own here. But I would like to know if there's any data, if anyone knows. Chris, um, I am not aware at, at this moment in time people have been discriminated against. Um, so I'm not going to contribute further. Um, I don't. I don't know. I I haven't perceived or seen or seen, seen any any evidence of discrimination um, within um, within protests. But that doesn't mean to say that that hasn't happened. Um, my uh, awareness and knowledge of that is that it hasn't happened. But um, I mean, there is there is one example of a geologist, an earth scientist in America. Um, who had a government job, and after a 30-second protest at a conference, um, she did lose her job. Um, but reinforcing Chris's point, um, she now has two jobs. <laughs> um, so in fact, lots of um, climate-oriented philanthropists came forward and made sure that she didn't suffer for it. 
Um, so that was a, a recent um, American Geophysical Union uh, protest. Um, I think the fear for many um, scientists would be the hidden discrimination. So it's a little bit like um, if you're gay, um, did you not get your grant renewed because somebody found out in the bad old days? Um, you'll never know. Um, my hope is that that's not going to be such an issue. And I think what we really want to do is um, get our unions, the UCU and others, to actually come forward. And in some universities, they have made statements um, saying that they will support their members who um, suffer discrimination within the university. So I think the solidarity in numbers is really important. And I'd just like to say, I don't think I'd want to work for a company or an institute that discriminates against me or fires me for taking climate action. Um, I think I'd rather take action than end up at a point in life where I'm, I'm watching the destruction and just thinking, oh, but at least I have my, my nine to five. I don't know. It's just, yeah, just morally, I just feel like, yeah, if, if they want to fire me, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's personal, you know, seeing where that line is. Yeah, yeah, it's all personal weighing things up. What's Chris going? I think there were two two other things that were said afterwards that I'd maybe like to have a conversation about. So you, you mentioned about getting political and, and looking to other arenas. Uh, so within XR, there, there are most definitely um, others, other arenas. Um, for example, uh, you know, there is a lot of work being done with unions. Um, so my, my partner is a, is, a, is a union representative. And we went down to Brighton and, and mo I would say about half of the conference was talking about the effects of climate change. Um, and there was, a, there was a lot of, of talk and discussion around the union's unison conference. So, um, you know, the, the, these, these things are entering the sort of political discussion and, and we do have um, a lot of people that are representatives from various unions um, within XR that are, that are talking about these things too. Um, so, I th yeah, I just wanted to add that point. Thank you. I think we have uh, one more question at the back. Um, but actually, just before, uh, I, I can mention that my experience um, as an activist at Imperial um, has led to some repercussions. So I used to work as a sub-warden in a student hall here. Um, I got involved in activism in the action of Bayes where I was arrested. That got put onto the front of the student newspaper here called Felix. That, say, that same week, um, I was brought into a lot of um, issues with my accommodation, which they argued were unrelated. But they, in themselves, were minor but they escalated them to the extent that I was thrown out of the student halls and I lost my job there. Um, so, yeah, there are costs sometimes. But bear in mind that I wasn't just on the street with a banner. I was involved in an action that was we were deliberately trying to make as much nuisance as we could. So I was at the extreme end. This isn't just something that, it, that happens to anyone who joins Scientists for Extinction Rebellion or Scientists Rebellion. This is like something that, that you, you think about and you think, well, what could the risks be? What could happen? And it's really important to have that in the back of your mind because you don't know what's going to happen. In the case where I lost my accommodation, it was a really good thing for me because I hated living there anyway. But I, I, for others, of course, you know, you might lose something that's much more difficult. I spoke to a mother who said that she would never be arrested because then she would lose the ability to raise her children. So there are plenty of people out there who want to get involved in activism but feel that these barriers are preventing them. But as we showed a list online uh, on the slides earlier, there are many, many ways to engage with activism which are not dangerous and not going to put your reputation or, or, or yourself at risk in any way. You could be someone who proofreads a document to make sure that it's right. You could be someone who um, is uh, arrestee support. You go to the, you know, you, you help the people who have been arrested. Um, it, it could be where you're engaging with the public on the street, talking to the public. It can be helping to make resources. Um, 
it could be photo editing and videos and interviews and raising the profile. And activism can also be what you do at work. Activism could be starting the conversation with, the, with your peers. <laughs> it could be as simple as that, but it's hard. But it's, but it's not dangerous. It's not going to get you in prison for doing that. But it's, I would say, under the umbrella of activism. One more question. I might have a question, but um, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Tristram for bringing up uh, the case of it's uh, Rose Abramov and Peter Kalmus who held up a banner at the American Geophysical Union, Geosciences Union, the AGU. Um, not only uh, does Rose now have, as you say, multiple jobs, um, I, I think over a thousand scientists signed a letter uh, objecting to the AGU's treatment of Rose and Peter. So if we're thinking about um, you know, credibility and respect within the scientific community. I think just the sheer number of people who signed that letter very quickly uh, says something. Not only that, um, but Scientists Rebellion themselves have organised events at conferences, which have gone onto the conference website as a legitimate part of the event. So if we're thinking protest is always something that's happening outside, not anymore. Um, the uh, ESEB, the European Society, I can't remember what it's called, I've just looked it up and immediately forgotten, um, but we can send details. Um, the EGU, so the European Geosciences Union, also has some events coming up um, run by Scientist Rebellion. And increasingly, they are packed with people wanting to know what they can do. So the credibility and the acceptability of actually using your scientific knowledge to say something about the wider world, I think is just, you know, it's, it's not, it's being questioned by a very small number of people these days, and they seem to be in the minority, as, you, as we can see. Um, I'm sure the other thing I was going to say was, uh, definitely want to echo what, what um, Shanna said about not wanting to be in this world and not actually, you know, uh, use what you're, you're doing in, in science uh, to, um, to say, well, actually, this is, this is a problem. My field is global health. Um, if my colleagues find that there's a treatment for malaria that could uh, save lives, they don't keep quiet about it. Um, you immediately make a statement and you say, well, if we do this, it will save lives. And I don't see how um, speaking out about the climate crisis is any different whatsoever. Um, I don't know how much longer you wanted to... There's a question online. Oh, brilliant. There's uh, one more question online I should mention, I think, before we, we close. From uh, Leader Parker asks, how do you engage and inform colleagues, etc., without scaring them into paralysis? This is a really uh, important thing, I think, because, I mean, I work in a department which is about <laughs> the climate impacts of aviation, yet they still fly to conferences in Berlin, right? So this is something where if I were to have a conversation with them about this, it's, it wouldn't necessarily scare them into paralysis, but it scares me into paralysis and in raising the discussion with them because they should know better. I mentioned it once and then it, you know, dialogue really does close down very quickly. But um, to respond to the question, does uh, anyone, including Chris online, have any responses to that? How do you engage and inform colleagues, etc., without scaring them? Chris. So <clears throat> there is this. Uh, when when we first did our analysis, we looked at like all the newspapers. I, I kind of I, I have this framework that I that's come out of this. Uh, so some we, we just read the newspapers and we said you know some sat on this particular side. Some sat on this particular side, and, and we had this, had this kind of sentiment analysis um, where some people were overtly positive, some people were completely neutral, some people were, were negative. Um, and in, in conversations, you can have very, very light, non-activisty type conversations. You know, just like discussing. Um, I think Tristan mentioned earlier um, with regards to the the JSO um, tomato soup incident. Um, and you can you can have a you can have a little uh, a judgment on on how they respond and, and where they sit on that that kind of spectrum. That's a, that that maybe is a starting point and just like something easy, something that pops up in you know 
in, in uh, the, the news or anything else and, and use that as a, as a, as a question starter. And, and then over time, obviously, you know, you, you, can, you can change to a slightly more activist type conversation when, when you've had, had these, these discussions. The best people to focus on to start off with, quite frankly, are people that are maybe on the fence or are slightly positive. And, and, and the, you know, the, I, I started off incredibly pro getting involved, but didn't know how to get involved. Um, so there was there, there was the problem for me. I didn't I didn't I didn't know where to put my energies. Um, so I would say start off with a very very easy set of conversations and and just think about it over time. What what option what opportunities are there to have further more deeper conversations? Um, this is a marathon, not a sprint, as I as I say quite often. Thanks, Chris. Shana. Yeah, I'd say like um, making a situation in which invites them to come to you with the conversations. Like, um, I think for example, like wearing a badge, like having like on your lanyard, like an XR symbol. So like, oh, what's that? Um, so if they ask a question, or I'll do the thing where I'll just like leave flyers, like all over the site and things. Like if it's a talk or something where I can invite people, or you know, some something interesting to pique people's conversation, so they can ask me, and then that delves into conversation instead of just having, you know jumping in um, and bombarding them with things or yeah you never want you never want to guilt someone you know if they mention like oh I'm flying to Barbados this you know month um, you can just say oh I don't fly anymore because you know uh, because of the climate crisis or something but don't say like oh why are you flying or like try and like guilt them but maybe say oh I personally choose to do this or for example like the vegan diet as well you can just mention like oh yeah no I, I eat like this and if they ask why you bring up um, yeah, your reasons to without being, I think I think that's a good way to be non-confrontational as well with the discussion, um, and not kind of jumping straight into we're all gonna die, <laughs> like uh, you gotta change your life. It's like more like okay, this is why I live like this. This is why I'm making these decisions, and kind of yeah, I can I think gently, kind of take people in the increments. Yeah, and and then the uh, the conversation then grows into more systemic issues rather than individual action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I. I think we should uh, we should close it there. Thank you very much uh, to Tristram and uh, to the, the panelists as well, and to, to everyone to, to, to come and for, for the questions online as well. Thank you for that, and uh, thanks for your patience with the issues around the live stream link. Apologies for that, um, but yeah, it's, it, it will be recorded. So if you did miss the first part, then um, we'll we'll um, have a recording available. Uh, thank you very much, and we really hope to see everyone at the big one starting at the 21st of April. Thank you very much. Thank you.